Coming up on All About Android, Ron Richards, Ryan Whitwam, and myself, we discuss Project Stream, the Made by Google event, give you a little bit of a preview based on what we know. The Sony Xperia XZ3, I go hands-on with that. Red's delayed Hydrogen One device. The LG V40 Thin Q and its five cameras and what they all do. Wear OS 2.1 and is it any good? Your email and a whole lot more next on All About Android. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This episode of All About Android is brought to you by ExpressVPN. Protect your online activity today. For three months free with a one-year package, go to expressvpn.com slash allaboutandroid. And by LastPass, secure every password-protected entry point to your business. Join over 33,000 businesses and start managing and securing your company's passwords today. Learn more at lastpass.com slash twit. Hello and welcome to All About Android, episode 389, recorded on Tuesday, October 2nd, 2018, your weekly source for latest news, hardware, and apps for the Android faithful. I'm Jason Howell. And I'm Ron Richards. Sup, Ron? How you doing? I'm doing all right. I'm hanging in. I got my sweet Karatika shirt on. <laughs> we were trying to figure out before the show if it's pronounced Karatika or I called yeah. it kar Karateka for some reason. Karatika, I've heard. Yeah, Karatika. I always, I, I'm pretty sure growing up, I always said Karatika. Yeah, I, I, I definitely heard. I heard the kids on the playground call it Karatika, but yeah. for me, it was always Karateka. I guess I just had oh. to stand out. What about you, Ryan Whitwam, writer for Android Police, Wirecutter, and many other places? How did you pronounce it? I have literally no idea what you're talking about. So <laughs> wow, and there's <laughs> a generation go, gap. I will just. I will just uh, I will just go with whatever you guys decide. <laughs> so, so Ryan, this two. is how you this is how you can tell that Jason and I are Jason and I are old men because <laughs> we're, we're referring to a game I played on my Apple II Plus in yeah. 1985. Yeah, my, so Commodore, yeah. my Commodore I was, 64 I, in the I mean, mid 80s. I, I existed <laughs> in 1985. I didn't ha I didn't have the manual dexterity to play computer games, but <laughs> hey, listen, yeah. all you needed all you needed was the I key, the J key, the K key, and the M key, and you could explore a world. It was wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> We've come so far. How you doing, Ryan? It's really great. It, Great, great to get you back on the show. It's been quite a while since we had you on last. Um, I'm, I'm doing very well. Right and on. it is a pleasure to be here, as always. <laughs> right on. It's great to get you on. Uh, we, well, wh why dance around it? Well, oh, that well, yeah. There First, is. let's show some <laughs> full motion video of the high res feed that is Karateka, Karateka, whatever you want so to call was, it. So, so for you kids at home, this was the this was the game that came out before Prince of Persia. The same Jordan Mechner, the, the developer who did Karataka, did Prince of Persia, which went on to become a, a hit and a movie yep. star in Jake Gyllenhaal. Yep. Gyllenhaal. But uh, it all started with Karataka, where you would just you would do karate and it was pretty badass. It, it was. <laughs> I always felt like it was just a little slower than it needed to be. Like you'd be mashing those buttons and that fist comes out at like two seconds. <laughs> and it had the great yeah, that, uh, that guy just kind of tipped over at the end there, didn't he? Yeah, yeah he gave up. up. And you have that great, the the great tinny kind of just like her, you know, just like <laughs> punching noise. Yeah. Just, <laughs> oh, oh, the the good old days. days. Uh, <laughs> all right, let's uh, let's talk about some actual news in the news section where we do that sort of thing. Okay. <laughs> oh boy, we got more charts and graphs and Android distribution numbers. Ron's favorite time of year on Android News. <laughs> yep, we only do this once a year. Actually. I do love the numbers. No, we do it like seven times a year. Yeah, we don't quite do it 12 times a year anymore because that got really kind of old and boring. But we do do it every once in a while when it's notable, let's say. I don't know if this time around is totally notable, but I do know that a gentleman that we've mentioned on the show before, Tyler Hilliard, is awesome because he now manages this doc that you can get to uh, I don't know how to link to it, though. I guess go to our show notes, twit.tv slash AAA for today's episode, and you'll find it. He calls it the Android versions over time, and he's updating this regularly. So when there's new numbers that post on distribution numbers, he goes through here and, and put, puts the numbers into this sheet, and it just does some really cool analysis. So definitely worth checking out. But as far as the numbers are concerned, the main points, 19.2% on Oreo, 29.3% Nougat or Nougat. There is no pie 
uh, still registering at this point. And uh, I don't know. I, I'm wondering if we should be concerned about that. What do you think, Ryan? Should we be concerned there's no pie on this chart, on this pie chart? Um, so I think uh, it's, I guess, uh, don't panic yet. Okay. Um, I actually, I was actually looking back uh, at, at our, our Android police version history thing we do every time Google updates the sheet to see when um, when Oreo popped up last year. And it was, it was, uh, I think it was the, it was the October, uh, the October numbers. And it is October now, but technically Google has not released anything yet. Um, they just released a September update like a week ago. I guess that's why it's news now. Like they, they updated at a very weird time. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and when it, when it appeared uh, last year in, in October, we only had 0.2%. So I guess it's possible that Pi is tracking a little bit behind Oreo, which um, I guess is is in and of itself a bit of a disappointment, even if it's not that much worse, because I think everybody was hoping that Pi would be faster because right. this is the first year that a lot of phones have had Project Treble. Everything that should be Oreo yeah. had to have that. Um, and it has, I mean, it sort of felt like more phones were getting updates, right? Because like uh, the Essential phone had it uh, day and date, you know, when it was launched. Uh, all the Pixel phones are updated. There's the One Plus Six now, but those are kind of all, you know, those are like nerd phones. Yeah, none of the, none of the phones people actually have. Totally, <laughs> totally. The, yeah, by and large, the majority of Android device ownership are not falling into those categories. You're right; they're the nerd phones, and and one could definitely believe that they would be so low compared to the overall amount of devices out there reporting on these stats um, yeah. that they don't even you, register 0.1%. And yeah, and I was about to say, and it's, uh, so like the threshold is 0.1%. So I think at this point, we can safely say that pixels plus a central phone plus one plus six is less than a tenth of a percent of all the Android devices <laughs> in the world. Apparently so. It's kind of depressing. If you go back to the sheet, uh, Victor, and you scroll down, uh, down to the projection adoption rate, you'll see a kind of an area where Tyler kind of goes into more of a projection um, mode as, as uh, you know, and, and it's hard to know. It's hard to know if this is, if this is actually going to happen. Right. But basically he feels really optimistic that once Pi gets started, it's going to go above and beyond anything we've ever seen before. And yeah, I mean, saying, project trouble would lead us to believe that. Right. Yeah, and he's saying in under, in under two months, it'll be at 40, 39% market share, which, which is crazy. Uh, that, uh, that's so so hard for me to how many, believe. How many, we, how many weeks has that. it been out so far? How many weeks has it been out so far? It was uh, early August, I think, that it launched. So right? we're uh, we're yeah. So we're more than a month in. So it's yeah, already well. Uh, yeah, this two. projection is is. Uh, <laughs> sorry, Tyler, but this projection is already <laughs> crashed and burned because <laughs> according to the projection, yeah. it should it should be at twenty uh, percent by now. Yeah. Oh man. Mail. Yeah, this is very very optimistic. But yeah, I mean, I think so too. <laughs> And I guess it. Uh, I think the the most telling aspect will be when Samsung gets around to updating its uh, this the the 2018 devices to Pi because there was a weirdly long wait for Oreo on uh, on last year's Samsung devices. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if they can do it faster this time, then maybe maybe there's some hope. Um, I mean, I, I know that the, there have been like leaked builds already for I think the Note Nine. So you know, we'll have to see. Yeah, right around the corner. Another thing I thought was interesting is just kind of a trend from version to version is that at the 12 year or sorry, the 12 month mark, the one year mark, uh, Marshmallow was at 18.7%, Nougat was at 17.8% and Oreo was at 19.2%, all very consistently at one year, still less than 20%, but right around the same. So that'll be another interesting fact if when we get to a year and realizing that's a, that's a ways away where Pi will be at a year's point after three consecutive versions, all hitting roughly about the same point after a year. Uh, yeah. If Pi is like double that, then, hey, we know that Project Treble, you know, actually made some sort of a, a, a an effect on this. Yeah, I bet we're still going to see a, a couple more phones come out this year running Oreo. Of that's going to happen. Of course. Yep. Uh, so anyways, uh, really cool uh, kind of visualizations in this. So uh, we'll check in on this probably more than we were prior because it's always fun to look at data when it's visualized so uh, captivatingly like this. So uh, thanks for making that, Tyler. Appreciate it. Who, does, who doesn't love a good data visualization? I know. Yeah, a pie no. chart, as it, as it were. <laughs> oh, Jason. What? I'm, I'm sorry.
It's uh, true. It's a pie chart. He <laughs> walked right into that one. Ron All right, saved well, me. So, yeah, well, so um, every now and then something happens in the Android or the, the Google world, and I just see it fly by on Twitter, and I go, oh, what is that? And this week, it was the fact that, uh, you know, for a while, we've been talking about the rumor of a gaming system of sorts coming from Google called Pro Codenamed Yeti. Well, it turns out it exists, and it's actually a Chrome-supported web service for streaming games to the browser. Uh, and what we saw this week was a partnership with Ubisoft and the demo show Assassin's Creed Odyssey. And I was like, whoa, that's in the browser? And sure enough, it was. Um, it doesn't require extra hardware like it, uh, like NVIDIA's GeForce Now and The Shield. And no word on whether this is going to work with Chromecast or Android TV in the future, but that would be awesome. Uh, Ryan, you wrote about this. What can you tell us about uh, Project Stream and how, how it all works? Uh, well, I can tell you the way Google announced it was pretty weird. Uh, <laughs> so they just put up a little blog post like, hey, there's this thing, and you know, it's going to launch in a couple days. I feel like this was kind of a bigger deal. They should have maybe, I don't know, should have, <laughs> should have hyped it up a bit, should have set expectations, or I don't know, maybe, maybe they're worried it's going to not work. But in a couple of days, uh, you'll somebody, not all of us, you can sign up for to maybe get access to Project Stream, and you'll be able to play the new Assassin's Creed game for free in your browser uh, until the test ends, which Google says will be sometime in January, whenever, you know, whenever it's gotten what it needs from you. Uh, and then I guess you will no longer have access to it. I, I, they're very unclear on, you know, if it's going to continue existing as a service after that that you would like pay for, or if this is just like a limited test and then it's going to go away until sometime in the future. But I mean, you know, the demo, it's just, you know, it's it says that it was uh, streamed through through Google's project stream at uh, 1080p, 60 frames per second. And it looks it looks nice. I mean. It, I mean, it looks like an Assassin's Creed game. There was just one like a year ago, so it, it doesn't look vastly different than the one you can already play. But um, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it seems like this could be like Google's play to turn almost any device that it sells into a gaming system. I mean, if, if you can run like a Chrome tab, then you should be able to do this. Yeah, that's, that's, that's crazy. It was like one of those things. I was like, that's in, a, that's in Chrome? How does that work? Yeah, I mean, NVIDIA has been doing, you know, the game streaming stuff for a couple of years, and it hasn't really worked, uh, I think, largely because you had to have an expensive piece of NVIDIA hardware, or at least somewhat expensive, you know. Um, you you know, today it would be a Shield Android TV box that you can get for, I don't know, 175 probably if it's on sale. Um, before, it was the Shield tablet or the Shield portable. But, I mean, you have to have NVIDIA's hardware. This presumably would work on a whole lot of things. So when you need a special piece of hardware, like in that case, the NVIDIA, um, the NVIDIA hardware, um, what, what exactly is that doing in this whole process? Is that, is, is that dealing I mean, with compressed video? Is that accelerating? I, I, I imagine that, I, I imagine that the, the video compression is somehow tied to NVIDIA yeah. software because they, I mean, they do make their own, you know, their own, their own chips. But, um, what we're really talking about is just being able to stream a 1080p, video with low enough latency that you can send commands back to whatever is rendering the game in the cloud mm -hmm. and not be you know not feel like completely disconnected from what you're doing i mean if you if you have a fast enough connection uh, i mean you should be able to you can maybe ping a server at like whatever like 25 milliseconds so round trip that's 50 milliseconds that's not that's not bad i mean you can you should be able to play a game uh with with that kind of like that shouldn't be you know, uh, really noticeable to you, mm -hmm. and it probably depends on the t the style of game too. If it's a yeah. you know fast press button masher fighting game or whatever, you're probably going to notice it a heck of a lot more than a yeah. Free I mean, I think, I think maybe uh, maybe Assassin's Creed is is a, a conscious choice because those games have kind of a little bit of um, fuzziness to the controls. You right. know, right. Yeah, um, and yeah, that that would be a, a great way to increase value on something like an Android TV box or even a Chromebook. Or, or a Chromebook. I mean, I would like I, or a I would like to yeah. play some games on my Chromebook. Yeah, no kidding. Well, and and to that degree, then you know they end up. I mean, they've slowly but surely been doing this with Chrome OS, but they end up adding more and more workarounds, more and more ways for you to turn it into an air quotes real PC or real computer. You know what I mean? To to make up for the the often used criticism that it's just a browser machine. It's like, yeah, but there are ways to do these other things too. So interesting. Cool. Uh, all right. And then, uh, by the way, we probably could have made like a whole show bumper that is like Ryan, Ryan writes because so many of your articles 
I right. do. I do a lot of that. Yeah. Because <laughs> so many of your art, so many of the stories that we were going to talk about, you had already written about. So uh, we're going to lean on you pretty heavily on some of this stuff here. Uh, you wrote about the ringer volume controls in Android Pi. I had never made the connection because I don't really change my ringer volume because I usually have my ringer muted, but I never yeah. made the connection that if you go into the settings and you change that, it it insists on playing the ringer and it's kind of annoying, yeah. right? Yeah, I, I had never actually thought of this uh, either because I just go back and forth between like whatever the ringer is set to and do not disturb mode. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's it, I don't know as somebody at Google just <laughs> apparently does what we do and they never noticed when they were testing this so yeah um now so in pi if you you change the volume with the the toggle on the phone it it's it's just changing the media volume and there's a button to toggle between ringer modes in that at that interface yeah. when you when you hit the volume buttons uh but if you want to change the volume of the ringer you have to go all the way into the settings and every time you move that slider like every every little every little little tap it's like okay i'm gonna play a sample of the of the ringer so you can decide every single time and it is uh yeah it's, it's very annoying like if you're trying to change the ringer volume in sort of you know a, a darker sort of like like in your bedroom or something right. you just want to like set it so that you so that it's you know the proper the proper volume the next day if you're like in do not disturb or something but you're gonna make noise you're gonna you're, you're gonna wake people up and it's um it was it's a, a mistake i think but google said they're gonna fix it they're gonna roll out a change at some point they said a future android release so i mean maybe the next maintenance update will have it um Maybe when they launch the new Pixel phones, that you know that'll it'll be included in whatever whatever Android version rolls out around then. So I mean, when you're changing the ringer volume, you do want to know how loud it's going to be. What was the behavior before? Was it a button to preview at whatever? So I think I think before it would make like a little a little uh, like a little beep sound. Oh, like that's subtly. right. But yeah. if you had the phone in Do Not Disturb, I don't think it made I don't think it made any sound. It would just Got have it. like. I I never I, I keep my phone in Do Not Disturb all the time so like i haven't run into this by the way the one plus uh six got it's the new version of oxygen which is their version of pi so i'm on nice. i'm on we're on parody now jason so cool. you're, um, you're part of the negative uh, the I less am. than 0.1 percent <laughs> of all of us proud proud to be the negative one <laughs> percent but um uh, I feel like this is like an this is like OS like they figured this out years ago. Like why why did it regress? Like, yeah, I don't know. Like it's it's got to be an oversight. an oversight. Yeah, yeah. totally. <laughs> uh, so <obviously>. strange. <laughs> so strange. All right. All right. Shall we go into an email? Yeah, let's do it. All right. So Abby wrote in and first off says, "I would just like to say, Ron, be nice to Victor." And <laughs> this is the best Abby, email ever. Already. <laughs> well, here's the thing. There's a long history in all about Android of me giving our our loyal TD a hard time. It goes all the way back to Chad. Yeah. So is, there's a long legacy. For a while, fan, uh, audience members got very upset at me about how, how me and Brian would tease each other. And so I hope you realize that I do it out of love and Victor's the best. So there you go. Um, that said, Abby actually had a, a legit question. I uh, said, but really, I was wondering if Android has any sort of built-in emergency SOS feature that would let you quickly call 911 without unlocking the phone and sends out messages to your emergency contacts similar to the iPhone. My wife recently found this feature on her iPhone, and I'm glad she has it. She would like me to set up something for this as well, but I won't touch an iPhone with a 10-foot pole. We are an Android slash iPhone divided house. <laughs> me too, Abby. I, I can relate. Um, I use a Moto Z Force 2. Um, so this is, I mean, I, I gotta give iPhone credit. I mean, having, I was glad that Android has the emergency contact, emergency information access outside of, uh, your passcode, right? So if something, God forbid, ever happens to you and you pass out on the street and someone needs to get your information, they don't need to be able to unlock your phone to get to your emergency info. By the way, if you haven't done that yet, go to settings and fill that out. Fill out your name, your emergency contact information, all stuff like that, because that is so key. But as far as sending a um, uh, uh, like a, a, an emergency alert or something like that, I've never heard of anything that is. Jason, have you ever heard of it? Or so, well, I did some digging around to see Android itself, it, like in the base OS, doesn't have this feature by default. Probably should. It seems like a really good feature to have yeah. in there. Um, Motorola, since he's talking about, since Abby actually, he or she is talking about, uh, the Moto Z Force 2, there, there's an app by Motorola that hasn't been updated since 2015 called Motorola Alert. 
That's because it's so good. They 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 perfected it. It's perfect. Three years ago. Yeah, yeah. there's no need to change the uh, the hamburger uh, style of the menu up at the top left hand corner. Anyways, uh, it sends out a constant stream of your location to selected contacts. So it's not quite the same. You activate it and then it just kind of broadcasts your location. Google actually has an app like this uh, called, uh, what is it, Emergency, uh, no, sorry, Trusted Contacts that continually shares your location uh, with contacts, contacts that you set up prior. They can also request the tracking if they think that you might be in trouble. And if you don't respond in like five minutes, it sends them your location. So there are ways to do that. For Motorola specifically, I couldn't find anything in settings. I did find that LG had a feature similar to this emergency SOS function. Um, I But I don't have an LG phone to check if it's still on there. Samsung also apparently has this in Galaxy devices. If you go to settings, personal, privacy and emergency, and then send SOS messages, you can... Um, you can pre-select contacts, and then it will send an emergency alert, uh, things like location, uh, a photo that's taken on the front and the rear-facing camera, a uh, snippet of, of short audio recorded from the microphone. So that's actually a really nice implementation because it does all this stuff and gives it to whoever you set it up in advance for. But I'm not sure about Motorola. Ryan, anything come to, to mind for you? Have you seen this feature on any phones? Um. So, well, the Motorola app, apparently, it doesn't, it, it's not compatible with anything anymore. So, oh, okay. So, it, it's, so dead. It's, it's dead. It's dead on the vine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't um, even do it. So, yeah, I know, I know Samsung has that feature built in. There's nothing that I'm aware of in, in base Android. And, um, yeah, I mean, the Google trusted contacts thing is probably your best bet, but it doesn't really do quite what the, what the emailer was asking. It would be nice if this were something built into, into base Android, but I mean, hopefully something that is not too easy to trigger. I mean, I, I know people who have accidentally called 911 on their Apple watch because like, I think you just hold, if you just hold the crown button down for long enough, it calls 911, I think. Oh, that's and that seems genius. like maybe it's a little too easy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but you know, it would be, it'd be nice. And maybe even if it's something that's not on by default, um, it should just be something that exists. Yeah, I think uh, like on the Samsung implementation and the LG implementation, both of them, you had to press the power button three quick times. You had to go doot, 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 and that would send it. But there too, it's very possible that in your pocket that happens and then you suddenly call 911. Or or send a message to your emergency. Yeah, I mean it's different if you're it's, just if you're sending a, like a message to a trusted contact. Totally. If that fires accidentally, it's not as big of a deal as if you you know you call the police in your pocket and yeah. they don't know what's going on. <laughs> right, and suddenly there they are. Um, and then I know that there are third party apps that do this. I just I haven't tested any of them. I haven't played with any of them, so it's really hard. Yeah, to I mean, I would one. be hesitant to trust a, a third party app to do something that important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, something safety related. You got to really know that they're, you know, that it's going to work in a pinch because a lot of times these things seem like a great idea. And then when you really need it, it doesn't work. It crashes on you. And I, I think that would be the wrong time for an app uh, to crash. For sure. On but seriously, if you haven't gone into the settings and put your emergency contact information, do it. I implore you because this is I, I, even even if you can't send an auto thing like Abby, what Abby's asking for, at least have some level of uh, emergency info in your phone. My God, emergency so. information. So this is my emergency information screen. Apparently, I don't have a contact or information. Oh, Jason, come so, on, man. All right. Well, then I'll find I'll do it. You got to do it. You got to do it. Um, yeah. No, I don't have anything in there. I'm, I'm all <laughs> unknown. Thank you, you gotta, Ron. You got to do it. You got to do it. Yeah. I mean. I mean, sadly, un unfortunately, from experience, uh, a few months ago, uh, I worked with someone who had something happen to them and uh, couldn't get into their phone because didn't know the lock code and didn't have any emergency contact information, and it was a bad scene. So if we have the ability to do it, you know, and 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 uh, emergency responders now know to look for it, and Android has it, so fill it all out. Ah, that's a really good pointer. Really I good. Guess you can just you can just try to guess which finger they have connected to the fingerprint sensor and just sort of mash the phone on their on their hand. Uh, I mean, that's, that's I, I, sadly, I mean, this is all this is all too real. But it was we were trying to use the fingerprint sensor, but they didn't have it set up. <laughs> and then uh, and then and this was not an Android phone; it was an iPhone. And we're able to from a locked iPhone, you could access missed calls. And so I was able to see where the missed calls were, and I saw one had called a bunch of times. So I'm like, oh, clearly that's somebody important in their life. So I called it, and it was a credit card collection agency. It's like, oh, oh God. No. Oh. That's <laughs> but, yeah. so, so that's the lesson I learned is fill out your emergency contact information. That's a PSA from all that Android. The more, the more you, you know. know. Yeah, so there you go.
All right. <laughs> Good stuff. All right. Uh, let's take a break and thank the sponsor of this episode of All About Android, and that is ExpressVPN. Uh, I'm sh surely you've heard, you know, there's a lot of news, a lot of online security breaches happening. It's hard not to worry about where your data is going or maybe has already gone. Uh, making an online purchase, uh, simply accessing your email could put your privacy, your private information at risk, and especially depending on where you're doing that. Are you doing that at the coffee shop or at the gym or whatever? You never know. You're being tracked online by social media sites, marketing companies, uh, your mobile or internet provider. Not only can they record your browsing history, but they often sell it to other corporations who want to profit from your information. And that's why I've actually been using ExpressVPN. Obviously, ExpressVPN is a sponsor. I've used a few different VPN providers in the past, and there's there's a couple of things that I really ha really like about what ExpressVPN is doing specifically. I'd say probably at the top of the list is a kill switch. They have an integrated kill switch so that while the VPN is working, and mind you, the, the speeds on this VPN, I would say, are better than the speeds that I've seen on the other VPNs that I've been using. Um, but when it's activated... If for whatever reason your computer, like the VPN stops or say you close your computer and then you open it later, that's going to kill the internet connectivity to your computer that's unprotected outside of the VPN until the VPN connects again. So it may really make sure that all of your data is passed through the VPN uh, while it's running, as long as you have that kill switch uh, activated. Uh, it has easy to use apps that run seamlessly in the background of your computer, your phone, or your tablet. Turns on with a single click. They make it super easy for you to activate it. Uh, secures and anonymizes your internet browsing, of course, by encrypting your data and hiding your public IP address. It allows you to safely surf on public Wi-Fi, which I highly recommend uh, without being snooped on or having your personal data stolen. Uh, it's rated the number one VPN service by Tech Radar and comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee. And it costs less than seven bucks a month. Uh, if you don't want to hand over your online history to your internet provider or data resellers, ExpressVPN is the answer. Protect your online activity today and find out how you can get three months free with a one-year package at expressvpn.com slash allaboutandroid. That's expressvpn.com slash allaboutandroid and you'll get three months free with a one-year package. And uh, that's what you need to know. ExpressVPN.com slash all about Android. And you can learn more about it. And I highly recommend that you do. It's a fantastic VPN at a fantastic price. Check it out. And we thank ExpressVPN for their support of all about Android. All right. We have some interesting stuff in hardware this week. Let's get to it. <clears throat> And Ron gets the preview. He gets the made-by-Google preview. Not only do we get to talk about the made-by-Google event, which is going to be next week, but after years and years and years of being shut out of Google I.O., I'm very proud to uh, let everyone know that I will be at the made-by-Google event in New York City on hand, in the room with Sundar. Uh, Practically to, sitting right next to him, right? Ready to – it's going to be Hiroshi, me, Sundar – and I'm going to have my scorecard of everything that's been leaked, and I'll be checking to see if that's <laughs> what's reality versus the leaking. Uh, but I will be there in person. And then what's great is it's on Tuesday, it's next Tuesday, and then we'll be right back here next Tuesday night to talk about it. Yeah, so, you will. Uh, we'll get some firsthand reactions uh, about what Google's bringing. But in the meantime, let's. Uh, of course, it wouldn't be another week without so some more leaks. Yeah. So, uh, so I saw this over the weekend that a the the new third generation Chromecast was accidentally sold at a Best Buy wow, uh, wow, wow. and uh, popped up on Reddit of all places, of course. Um, and this new Chromecast has got an updated design that no longer includes the magnetic HDMI cable and it's got a matte finish. It looks a little a little more uh, matty than the, than the current uh, generation of Chromecast. Yeah. Uh, but no details on the new features or how it works or what it does or anything. Weird, weird um, that there's no details on on any feature changes, but maybe maybe Chromecast is just a Chromecast now. like. Yeah, I think that there probably just aren't any feature changes. It's yeah. still just a Chromecast. <laughs> what else can they do? They've got yeah. the load fast version. They've got all the they've got the super HD version, you know? Yeah. Like I don't know what I mean, more we want from it from yeah. being a computer. I, I was I was hoping the next time Google refreshed it, they would find some way to 
give it just like a simple remote, just like a way to play and pause and yeah. like skip without touching my phone would be Is, would be great. Would that be an, uh, would that be like Google admitting to something that they don't want to admit to? Like their their grand experiment I mean, with Chromecast maybe, is like your phone like, is your remote. I mean, anybody yeah. who uses a Chromecast on a regular basis and hasn't had an app just stop working correctly. Yeah, and totally. then you're in that you're in that situation where you're like, boy, I wish I could pause this, but the app isn't working. I guess I'll force close it and then I'll open the app uh, again. And it's like, why am I doing this? Yeah. If there was a the remote it'd be done already. Yeah. It's the worst. When when Chromecast chokes, it's the worst. And it chokes like every half hour or so. Like I've had especially with with the Netflix app. Um if you're watching this like an hour long, it loses uh, the connection and then you've got to reopen the app and uh I don't know what Netflix has done to their app recently, but it is yeah. it is a mess. Huh. It is, yeah. So, all right. Well, so we get a uh, probably no new features, but a new look in Chromecast, and they got okay. rid of that pesky magnet. Uh, <laughs> uh, so then uh, we also got the leak of the Google Pixel Slate, which is uh, going to be the first Chrome OS tablet by Google. That's pretty interesting, Jason. You're you're a big Pixelbook user. Would you would you give the Slate a chance here? Um, I don't know because God, what was the name of the the Pixel? I I reviewed a, a C, Chrome. The Pixel C? No, no, I reviewed no. a Chrome tab. Was it, is it the Lenovo Chrome tab? I can't remember the name of it. Was it, it was it that Acer thing? Oh yes, it was the Acer thing. And yeah, that uh, was uh, that was that was kind of a strange device because it was pretty obviously supposed to be for education. But somebody at Acer was like, "Hey, let's have people review this." And Chrome OS was not ready. But I mean, oh no, totally not. I mean, even even if it was meant for education, like I think it failed in that front too. You know what I mean? Like it was just Chrome OS just did not work in the tablet form factor for me then. Although. I I will say I have the latest version of Chrome uh, OS on my Pixelbook, and you know they completely redesigned the whole interactivity yeah. and the look they've, and feel. They've made in the it last look update. kind of like Android on a tablet. Yeah, totally. So I could see it working well now. And hey, you know what? They probably do this on purpose, right? The event is yeah. next week, so it makes sense that they would do that. So I would definitely check it out. But my first inter interaction with Chrome on a tablet wasn't very positive. Yeah. I mean, I'm worried so, if they if they make this like a detachable, they're going to kind of punt on the keyboard, which would be unfortunate because yeah. the Pixelbook's keyboard is very good for a laptop. Completely agree. Yep. I love it. So as I as we're a week out from the Made by Google event, my scorecard of leaks uh, looks like this. This is what we're expecting. We're expecting the Pixel, the Pixel Three, and the Pixel Three XL. Right. Mm -hmm. Very. I would. We'd, we'd probably say that that's very likely to happen. Right? <laughs> yeah. Ninety nine point nine nine percent certainty on that one. Uh, mm -hmm. This new updated Chromecast uh, that we'll see what they talk about there. Uh, the Pixel Slate. Um, also the Google Home Hub, which we talked about a couple weeks ago. The uh, the Google Home with a screen, basically, uh, and the Pixel Stand, the little charging kind of spot, and the updated Pixel Buds. So that that's what we're expecting next week. Is there any room for any surprises? Is there anything that hasn't been leaked yet that we that we think we might see or we we hope that we might see? What what else could exist in the made by you, Google category? So, right? Do you not do you not subscribe to the conspiracy theory that Google has a secret third Pixel phone that's the actual XL that looks better than the the three XL that's leaked a million times? I do not that's subscribe the to that theory. In fact, I burned my subscription to that theory. <laughs> I want to subscribe to that, to that theory so badly. I want that to be true. I, I no, See, I, I think it's total nonsense, but I would totally love it if it were true because that oh, would just yeah. be such a wacky, insane thing to have happened. I mean, yeah. how like Google, how would they have possibly kept something like that secret? It would be fun, but it's not going to happen. No, it's no. not going to happen. But no doubt, if they actually did pull that off, like I'd have to, I'd have to eat some serious crow and give them big time props for pulling it well, off. So but we, I don't think it's going to happen. We do know that they reached out to some of the negative reviews of the leaked devices, asking permission to use it. We don't know why. We're assuming it's in the presentation. I, I'm, I'm very curious to see uh, what that, what, how that, what the it, context of that is going to be. It, it might have, it might have just been like a, a junior PR person at Google who didn't know what they were yeah. doing. Yeah. I, I, with these sort of things, I always subscribe to Occam's Razor, in that the most obvious thing is probably the truth. It's probably yeah. the case, uh, yeah. um, but we'll we'll see. Uh, do we think there's going to be a watch or any sort of uh, wa uh, wearable type stuff? I mean, if there was going to be now, uh, I think we would have seen some leaks already. Yep. But um, I wouldn't I wouldn't rule it out for later, like for a next year sort of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean. They uh they 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 rolled out those the the LG watches that they partnered uh they Google partnered on them with uh what in like 
early, whatever year that was, was it early 2016? I think that the the watch style and the watch sport came out. Oh yeah, like that would the big be launch of like 3.0. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I could see a Google Watch coming out, uh, you know, later. I guess this is something we can we can discuss uh, soon. I have I have many feelings on this. <laughs> um, you're talking about Wear OS, right? Yes, I am. I am talking about why. Uh, why Wear OS. soon? Let's just do it now. Do we have the hard? Yeah, sure. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> We are not locked into any predetermined plan, See, a.k.a. This, this a, is, a show notes this, list. This is why Victor's a great TD, because he was ready to go. He was ready to go, <laughs> exactly. See? So so where OS 2.1? <laughs> what did you think? So, um, like, it's it's a step in the right direction. Um, the, the, the 2.0 update, I think, was an unmitigated disaster for a myriad of reasons. Um not least of which it made it very, very tedious to manage notifications on your watch, which is kind of one of the main things I want a smartwatch to be able to do. Uh, so the new one is a little bit better with with notifications. You can scroll smoothly through the, the notification list, but it still unbundles all of your notifications, which I think is unnecessary. It makes it uh, slower to get to everything. Um, there's like there's the new uh, assistant tab on the left. Google Fit is over on the right. It's like it's more accessible. Uh, so, y- you know, you don't like change watch faces by swiping anymore, which was a waste of a very easy gesture. Absolutely. Uh, I don't think people right. change watch faces that much that it needs to be so easy. Yeah. Um, and then the the quick settings is a little bit expanded. Um, I, I mean, that, this is all good stuff. Um, but when you look at what Apple is doing with the Apple Watch, um, it really, it, it, it hurts me that yeah. Apple like, cares about their wearable to such a degree that it's become a thing that people actually like to use. And I don't think that there are a lot of people who actually like to use their Wear OS <laughs> device. I think there are people who use them because they spent 300 bucks on a watch and they don't want to just stop using it. But there's there, there are just there are problems with Wear OS. And a big chunk of it is that Google does not have its own piece of hardware that it can, it can focus on. Um, so like uh, right now, Wear OS, it's got this new Google Fit interface, which is great, but Google Fit is very bare bones. Uh, it doesn't it, it, it doesn't like do things like automatic ex- exercise tracking that a lot of other watches can do. Uh, like if you if you wear a Fitbit or uh, a Samsung Tizen watch, they'll automatically figure out when you're working out and they log it. Uh, with Wear OS, you still have to like say, okay, I'm going to work out now and tell it what you're doing. Right. And it'll track steps and it does heart rate. But, you know, it'd be nice if it did more. And it's easier to do that when you have control over the hardware and the software. Um, and obviously with Android phones, you know, not having control of the hardware has, has led to some problems. But overall, it's worked. Um, the, the openness of the hardware has been a good thing for the platform. Uh, but with a, with a smartwatch, you have, you have less headroom. You know, you have to be very conscious of the resource man- management and, uh, and the way sensors are handled. And it's just not it's it's just not uh, working as well with this this uh, sort of open way to have people build watches because right now it's mostly fashion brands that are building these new smartwatches and they're just all using reference designs they're not innovating on the hardware they don't have the resources to do that so like you know Asus and Motorola and all these the technology companies that might be able to do that they've stopped making watches because yeah because they were technology companies trying to make <laughs> watches and you yeah. know, running into their own. You know, yeah. Although, there. you know, it is funny, though. I think the most attractive uh, Android Wear slash Wear OS device we ever got was the original Huawei watch. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Huawei I didn't know what it was doing. I think that they just kind of fell backwards into a really nice looking watch and they didn't understand why. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, building a watch is hard and building like a mobile device is hard and putting those two things together. It's just it's been it's been uh, much more of a challenge than I think people so, expected it to be. So. Google's Pixel phones is and 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 the user experience that you get on a Pixel device is Google's version of Android, right? It's 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 base Android, but with Google splashes. Android Wear or Wear OS, I always I always get it wrong. Um, Wear OS is the same UI for everyone, no matter you know who's making hardware, whatever. It's just, in, including if Google made it, I imagine they would probably uh, end up using the same. UI as well. Do you think they should come out with a Pixel Watch that has a different uh, user interface kind of design language similar to what they've done on the Pixel devices? Do you think that's the way to go? I mean, there's less. I mean, it's a smartwatch. There's less you can really change about it. Um, I mean, I think Google should have a Pixel Watch just regardless of how they do it, because Wear OS is such a mess right now. 
even if it means that they're going to like scare away all these fashion brands that are making watches nobody wants, then like, oh, well, a loss, I guess. I mean, that's I, the only way I see this working long term is if Google has a piece of hardware that they can actually develop Wear OS on and make it do interesting and useful things. Because right now, Wear OS is not very interesting or useful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it, and it was really apparent, like... Google made the announcement about the new Wear OS update that was coming up, and it looked it looked nice. And then a couple of days later, not to pull Apple back into the show, but a couple of days later, Apple showed off the new, you know, their new watch and the the amount of complications tied into it. I mean, it was just so obvious, like that yeah. they're they're completely I mean, on different there, planes. And like, there's there's an there's an EKG in the Apple Watch now. Like, there's no way. You, that you just you couldn't make that work on Wear OS right now. I mean, you, th there's no company with the engineering expertise to make it happen, and Google's the only one that could build the software into the OS to make that actually worth having. Uh, and I mean, nobody is like, there's nobody doing that that sort of stuff. I mean, the the like the, the health and fitness stuff on the Apple Watch has become a big big selling point, and that is one of the places that Google is painfully far behind. Yeah, um, and it's. I mean, it's unfortunate because I honestly, I think the Apple Watch is kind of ugly, but um, I mean, I think a lot of wear devices look nice, but uh, the software experience is just, it's not even comparable. Apple is way, way ahead. Yeah. And, and yet again, you get a lot of these wear devices. They look nice when you're looking at it front, front, front on like that, but then you end up seeing it on <coughs> wrist and you're like, man, that's yeah. a lot bigger than it should be. And yeah, I get, you know, I get like, why, but it just is. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm wearing a I'm wearing a TicWatch Pro right now, which, um, like in in photos, I feel like it looks it looks like a, a fairly attractive watch, but it is like really big and kind of unattractive in real life. Mm -hmm. You know, like yeah, I don't know. Maybe maybe we just have uh, in, incorrect assumptions on what watches should look like on wrists. I'm probably the wrong no, no, person no. to to I, judge. I maybe. To be I'm not, yeah, I'm not really like a I'm not really like a watch person. When I'm not wearing uh, when I don't have to have a Wear OS device on for like review or to like use a new new OS or or whatever. Like I I wear I wear a Fitbit the rest of the time. Yeah. Uh, a Fitbit Ionic, which is still kind of smartwatchy, mm -hmm. kind of, but like it lasts a week on a charge and actually knows how to track exercise automatically. And it's not a, a brick. <laughs> yeah. And it's, yeah, it is much more comfortable. It's, you know, and that's, and that's another thing. It's like um, sleep tracking is a thing that people are looking toward to these devices to do, but every Wear OS device is way too clunky to wear to bed. You're not going to want to yeah. do that. Heck no, no way. I, f I feel bad. We're talking about Wear OS and watches and watch size and flows not here to join us too. Uh, <laughs> so I feel like on Florence's behalf, I have to say uh, the watches are way too clunky and too big for small wrists. And yeah. Yeah. Women I mean, no, this, this watches is something too. that I that I complain about in every smartwatch review that I write because I have I have little wrists and like this watch is gigantic on me. I would I don't want to wear this in public. It's ridiculous. Right. Um, but like every time there's a watch that has multiple size options, I always I, I get the smaller one because I know it's going to actually fit. Right. 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 Uh, and, you know, the, the problem is the, the larger ones make a really good weapon. So, you <laughs> yes. know, you're missing out on that. Um, hey, so I, I got into the office today and I was surprised to find awaiting for me this device right here. It is the Sony. Remember when I was doing when I reviewed the Sony Xperia XZ2 Premium? This is the XZ3, which is their next flagship a couple of months later, which actually in reality, this is a step up from the XZ2, not the Premium that I reviewed a few months ago. So. Uh, so it's kind of a, a step up from the XZ2, which was earlier, much earlier this year, but still this year. So they're coming, they're pushing out a, a lot of flagships <laughs> in a single year, which is not a bad thing because I have to say they've made some really good changes on this in my short amount of time uh, after kind of pulling it out of the box um, a little bit earlier, probably like a couple hours ago. It's running uh, Android Pie out of the box, so the software. I feel like feels a lot more modern, uh, even on the XZ2 Premium. Things like it looked okay, but there were just some rounded. You know, there were just some edges that weren't quite. I don't know the, some design notes that I, I didn't quite care for. Some like pop-up windows that looked outdated in comparison with everything else that looked normal. Anyways, this is on Pi, so that's good right out of the box. It's a six-inch, uh, eighteen to nine display versus the sixteen to nine display that you had on the XZ2 uh, Premium. So things kind of, you know, the, the bezels end up being a little bit more minimal. 
uh, by comparison, that was one of my big complaints on the XZ2 Premium is that it had these really deep bezels on the top and bottom. And you know, some people are okay with that, but I feel like our eyes are just getting more and more used to to thinning those those lines out. And thankfully, they've done that here. Uh, it's OLED instead of LCD display, so things look a lot like you get a lot more of the dark, um, the contrast in there. Uh, it is not a 4K display like the XZ2 Premium, though. This is a 2960 by 1440 uh, display. It does have these curved glass edges on the front, which the XZ2 Premium had kind of curving on the back. And this does as well, obviously. And it feels like they've really kind of uh, tailored the the uh, the depth of the device and everything to kind of strike a nice balance, so it feels uh, feels really good in the hand and and those lines, you know, being the curvy glass and everything, it makes it look a little slimmer and and nicer. Definitely lighter, uh, and yeah, of course, it has, still has the the dedicated camera shutter button, and then most of the other stuff is is very similar, except of course for the fact that it has a single. Uh, rear-facing camera instead of the dual uh, rear-facing camera of the premium, the X XZ2 premium. But so far, I would say a big improvement. I'm going to spend a couple of weeks with this, uh, probably until I end up getting whatever the next Pixel device is that I choose. Uh, this is on pre-order right now for $899.99, so a little pricey. Uh, but, you know, so are so many other flagships right now. It releases on October 17th, so... I'm going to play around with it. I think Sony's really come a long way with their design. They they stuck to that kind of boxy design for a very long time. And I feel like the XZ2 and the XZ2 Premium, they were working out of that. And here's this is the first phone where I feel like, all right, they've got a design that I would be really proud of. You know, it feels really, really nice. And it looks, I just like the the curving that they have going on uh, with the yeah, front display. Yeah, it, um, it, looks, it looks a bit like the... Um the Pixel 2 XL in real life, except well, that the, yeah. the OLED actually, the OLED itself actually curves a little bit Yeah, at the end. It's kind of like a Samsung phone. Oh, I actually, I, I used one briefly at, at, uh, IFA a couple weeks back. Um, and I think, and we just, we just posted our, our review on Android police recently because we have a guy in the UK and they actually have them there already. Oh, okay. So that, so, um, and he, he liked the phone. Um, and, and what time I spent with it, I thought it was, it was a pretty solid improvement for Sony. The, the display is gorgeous. Yeah. The display um, is really I'm, nice. I'm, I think the fingerprint sensor is in kind of a dumb spot. Like it's so far South on the yeah. back. Like it's, you have to like change your grip to, to reach it. Yeah. But I mean, compared to what Sony was doing, like, you know, three months ago with, with the, the XZ2 premium, I think this is a vast improvement. I completely agree. Um, yeah, the, the the fingerprint sensor does feel like it's a little too dead center on the phone because you're usually going to be holding it right about there. And then, yeah, you know, it's, uh, it, you're going to you're going to touch the uh, camera lens yep. so much. And I've already done that a couple of times trying to unlock it. Yeah. So uh, definitely. Um, but yeah, so I'm going to play around with this. I'm, uh, I'm pretty excited to see uh, how this works out over the next couple of weeks. And I got to give Sony props because I've never really cared for their previous design kind of, uh, I don't know, aesthetic. Like, yeah, aesthetic yeah. that they stuck to for quite a while. I definitely oh, the like sharp edges. Going with this. I miss the sharp edges. Yeah. Oops. That's not the right <laughs> for that phone. Good job, Sony. Uh, catching up with the world. Yes. There it is. Maybe we'll see one in the wild someday. <laughs> um, all right. So uh, did you guys hear about the LG V40 thing, thin Q? Thin Q. With its five cameras. Mm -hmm. Maybe you were curious what those five cameras were for. Well, friend of the show, uh, Ev Leaks, posted a photo illustrating what each of those cameras are capable of. Um, on the rear facing three cameras, you have a, a camera lens for standard shots, super yeah, wide angle, image, and, and telephoto zoom. There you go. There and we you can go. see there, there, there are all the illustrations. So you got standard at the top, uh, super wide angle, and then telephoto uh, for the different lenses. And then on the front facing camera, you got standard and wide angle. So if you're wondering why you need five different lenses and five different cameras on a phone, there you go. There you go. All the I different mean, options. I, I don't. I still don't know if you need those, but that's what they do. <laughs> if you have them, <laughs> if so you I have mean, them, this is what you might choose to use. You might them as well for. use them. I mean, if you have a super wide angle lens, use it. What's the harm? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so I, I sort of still question the value of having more than one camera on on the back of a phone because the Pixel only has yeah. one in best photos of any Android phone you get. Any any yeah. phone, I think, including the iPhone, the new ones, uh, but. I mean, it's true. 
I, I, say, I, think I, it, I will say, I, I will say, sorry, to, uh, to, but uh, I, I moved from a Google Pixel One to the One Plus Six, with uh, which has got two lenses on the back, and I think the One Plus Six takes far better photos than the Google Pixel One. At least from what I've seen, I think I think, they, they, I, I think, they, I think we good. could we could probably fight about that. Um, we don't have to though. Um, <laughs> hey, no, don't fight. I'm I'm stuck in the middle. I'm gonna have to like separate you two. Get back. Um, so uh, the, the cameras, uh, like phones that have a secondary camera, I think the one that I like seeing the most is the telephoto lens because there's actually there's a good use case for that. Um, you know, if you want to get a picture of something, you're a little bit too far away. Yeah. You don't have to like move the camera in like really close because when you do that the wide aperture on phone cameras starts to distort and it looks really not authentic um so having like a you know something you take from further away i think is very helpful i um, mean the wide angle i guess okay it's not really something i ever use but again i think you know it it has a demonstrable benefit um what kind of bothers me about the, the one plus six is that it, the secondary camera is just a thing that they they tell you it's doing something you know like if you're in a dark room yeah. like it'll use the other one you have no way of knowing that, though. <laughs> All right. Well, I will. Um, I will say. That, I will say that going a lot of the the scenarios that I take pictures in often low light, uh, dark clubs like nightclubs. Where I'm taking pictures of bands and stuff like that. And I don't know if it's the second camera, the second lens is helping with that or whatever. But I have noticed that they do look much better than the pictures I was taking with yeah. the Pixel One. Um, mm -hmm. I will. I will say that uh, One Plus's camera performance has gotten noticeably better in the last year. I think the the six and the five T both. Uh, we're, we're pretty solid um, as far as cameras. And, and, you know, and there's probably going to be a new OnePlus phone soon, so we'll see if that one's any better. Yeah. Um, but, you know, but like you know, the V40, it's not... So it's the first, I think, widely available phone that'll have five cameras because there are two on the front as well as, as the back ones. There's, you know, the standard and wide, wide angle on the front. Um, but it's not it's not the first, like, phone you could buy with three cameras on the back. There's the there's the, uh, the Huawei P20. It has it has three on the back. They were different. I think it was, uh, it was it's standard, telephoto... Mm -hmm and monochrome i think right right uh, because huawei has like this weird uh, this sharpening algorithm they use with with the monochrome camera um and i monochrome cameras are kind of i don't really i don't really care i don't i don't take i don't need to take a lot of artsy black and white photos but they do look very nice if you like black and white photos mm -hmm. yes i would like i would i would like a phone with a cga camera if i can get that <laughs> Four going colors. back to our Going back to our Karataka discussion, okay. or EGA even. EGA, well, I'll take two EGA. Colors. EGA. EGA yeah, is two yeah. colors, right? Yeah. <laughs> Something like that. Uh, EGA was eight colors, I think. Eight or 16. I forget. Oh, anyway. I can't remember. <laughs> EGA, was, EGA was better than CGA. It was CGA, EGA, then VGA. Oh, uh, okay. All right. Yeah. All right, fine. You win the GAs. <laughs> um, let's see here. Red is apparently uh, delayed. They've been hyping their Hydrogen One phone for a while now. I think like a year now. <laughs> yeah, really. And <laughs> those who have pre-ordered the titanium version were apparently notified of a delay in production. There was a failure of the titanium body in production and they weren't satisfied. So they're delaying it further. Red uh, doesn't offer a timeline on when those pre-orders will be satisfied, but they are offering anyone that pre-ordered the titanium version a free aluminum version once it launches. And then they will, of course, follow that up with the titanium version when that's finally ready. <laughs> That's a costly well, mistake. Yeah. At least, yeah, at least they're, they're making they're not, it right. Yeah, they're not even making people send back the aluminum phone. You just get to keep it forever. Yeah. Hey, and that's a, that's that's still a twelve hundred dollar phone. The titanium one is sixteen hundred. Which, you know, when they announced this phone, I think those those prices would have sounded ridiculous. But you can buy a Note Nine right now that costs uh, twelve fifty. I think right for right. the the five twelve. Yeah gig version like it, these prices aren't actually that insane anymore well yeah especially um, when you consider 1600 for a titanium and an aluminum <laughs> of course yeah, you couldn't I choose know, right? to buy yeah. that but if you could go back well, in time and yeah. buy the buy the phone that failed get it, yourself a free it, exactly free it really begs the question what their cost what their cost of goods are on those phones you know like they're selling it for 1200 and 1600 but they're clearly they're eating the 1200 dollars cost that phone doesn't cost them 1200 dollars. i'm curious how much they're eating in this whole yeah, process i mean but, then, red, but then again, how many people how many people order titaniums though yeah, yeah see, red is a very strange company uh because yes. Yeah. They are they, they they cater almost entirely to professionals and like prosumer type individuals. Um, the kind of person who would buy a sixteen hundred dollar phone from Red probably is going to buy a lot of other things from Red in their lifetimes, and they don't want to give them any reason to go someplace else. It's probably in their interest to keep them happy, even if it means giving them a twelve hundred dollar phone. Yeah, right. Yeah, 
That's a very good point. Very, very good point. Yeah, and Red can't manufacture the phones. They don't have the facilities to do that. They they manufacture all their cameras, but they're working with somebody else to do the phone hardware. Mm-hmm. Um, and and titanium is hard to work with. I know when um, when Essential started talking up the Essential phone last year, they were they they were really crowing about how good they had gotten at manufacturing titanium frames. Um, and apparently, you know, whatever they were doing worked because I mean, for all the Essential phones problems, it is a nice looking piece of hardware. Uh, so yeah, and obviously the Red phone, uh, not so much with the titanium. Do we do we think we're going to see another Essential phone at this? I point? mean, probably not. I mean, I mean, I mean <laughs> like nobody knows, but there were all those rumors that they were being sold off, and yeah. uh, they didn't really. They didn't really refute those. They just sort of sidestepped the yeah, question. And they, I feel like I feel like if the company was doing fine, they would have smacked that down and been like, no, there's, there's gonna be a right. new phone, everything's great. Yeah. Uh, but they didn't really they didn't really do that. So I feel like things are not so good and it is unlikely there will be another phone. Yeah. And we still haven't seen the home device. And I know. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, uh, yeah. That was coming out later but this year, last year. They, they haven't even released that uh, that headphone jack accessory that they promised like three or four months ago, have they? Oh, How I don't they know. have I don't, they? The, the, the audio adapter. It's it's coming you know, co- coming soon as of September twentieth. So, uh, uh, they, uh, they I mean, also, you know what's <laughs> you know what's funny is I remember uh, like at at, I, at IO last year uh, they had a big party at their at their offices and we went and everything and like they were like showing up the phone and everything was like they were all super hyped and then like a month later it was like oops um never mind no well, mind. They did sh- they did ship Android Pie. Uh, they did. It, yeah, they did. So at least they. Um, that. Oh wait, no. The October twenty eighth. Uh, let's see. It was our October twenty eighth security update. Sorry, it's actually not Pie. Oh. <laughs> no, they, no, they had Pie. Like yeah. they had Pie on yeah. the same day as Pixel phones. Uh, oh, okay. They just All shipped right, an yeah. update so, that yeah, added uh, added notch support back because the that's initial right. update took away the ability to decide if the notch would be filled in or not. Oh yeah. Keep that decision there in the hands yeah. of the owner <laughs> at, at all costs, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, but I mean, you know, they're not if they're not building another phone, then they've got spare engineering resources, I guess. Yeah, yeah, I'm not finding anything on that audio thing, uh, the audio connector. Going back to Red, I wonder who is doing the the build for those phones. Like who who? Yeah, who, I don't you know. know. I'm, yeah. I'm sure that they would not tell you if you asked. Yeah, I, I didn't see anything. I did a quick search. I didn't see anything, but it's strange. All right. Uh, do you want to take a time out and thank a sponsor? Let's do it. Let's do it. I love it when I get to thank sponsors of products that I use every day. And that's why I'm so excited to tell you that this episode of All About Android is brought to you by LastPass, my password manager of choice. Uh, and you might want to ask yourself, what is your company doing to ensure passwords are being shared appropriately? LastPass Enterprise makes password sharing convenient for employees while keeping access to corporate data secure. It even allows for full customization of access, including the ability to set master password requirements, enable password resets, and restrict access access when needed. Configure over 100 policies, access security reports, and create shared folders. Organize database logins, SSH keys, software licenses, and business information. It's amazing. LastPass is so good. You can further protect your business with multi-factor authentication with the LastPass Authenticator app. A verification pop uh, button pops up on an employee's phone to guarantee they're the only ones with access to their accounts. If credentials are compromised, the app ensures outsiders will not have access. And the LastPass password generator makes it easy to use unique random passwords that employees don't have to remember or write down. Employees can log into LastPass with their Microsoft Active Directory uh, credentials, so they truly only have one password to remember. Data is encrypted and decrypted at the device level, and data stored in the vault is kept secret, even from LastPass. From easy onboarding to password autofill, LastPass makes it easy for businesses to take control of passwords and reduce the threat of a breach. And in this day and age, you do not want a breach. Their security is so important. You need to make sure that everything is encrypted, protected, and passwords are not easily uh, accessible. Um, I got to tell you, I was in my office the other day and I opened up a draw uh, that had clearly been in this office building for years and written on post-it notes on the side of the draw were someone's passwords from several <laughs> years ago. And I was like, oh man, I didn't know people actually did that. And luckily companies like LastPass make it so you don't need to do that anymore. Um, so with their iOS 12 and Android Oreo autofill functionality, they make it easier for employees to seamlessly use LastPass across mobile devices. When you open an app or visit a mobile site, the keyboard itself will offer your username or password as an autofill option, similar to what autocorrect looks like now. 
No more copying and pasting from your LastPass app. They just keep making this product better and better. LastPass also offers LastPass Premium for personal use, LastPass Families for your entire family, and LastPass Teams for teams of 50 or fewer. Uh, like I, I, you know, I said, I, I'm a personal user of LastPass. My wife, I got my wife on LastPass. I use it for everything. It's the only way to keep track, uh, you know, to keep store all your passwords and not have to worry about, I don't have to worry about forgetting them, typing them incorrectly, and also nobody gets that access to it. LastPass is so great. In fact, Jason, you're the one who turned me on to LastPass years ago, and I'm glad you did because it changed my life for the better. Yeah. So LastPass is amazing. I'm one of more than 13 million people that trust LastPass, making it the number one most preferred password password manager. So you can learn more at lastpass.com slash twit. That's lastpass.com slash twit and see what, what product is right for you. And trust me, one of them is going to be right for you because LastPass is awesome. Thanks, LastPass, for supporting this episode of All About Android. Thank you, LastPass. All right. Speaking of awesome apps, it's time for some apps. App it. That, that may or may not be awesome. I think this first one's pretty awesome. Uh, although I could, I could have swore that we talked about this at some point but i know it's this, a new app this definitely this definitely existed it did um, before I think, right i think it did because uh when i went to the app listing when this popped up it said it was already installed on some of my devices um and i remember using it i think that it's been in like beta for ever oh, okay and now it's like a thing that they're opening up they're i guess actively. even though i think the i think the the listing if Beta for me when I go to it, but I oh like I because uh, I'm enrolled in the beta. That's how I had it before. Uh, but I feel like it's been a while since okay. this uh, came out. What uh, is now? What is this thing? It's called Voice Actions. <laughs> I yeah, never actually kind of buried the lead there. Sorry, that's okay. No, no, that's okay. I realized halfway through we hadn't even mentioned the name. Uh, voice Actions. So what is Voice Actions? Uh, it's by Google's accessibility team, and it's basically it's an app that once you give it certain accessibility permissions. Uh, and it's running, all the options that are presented on your screen, on your device, will get a little number and a voice prompt so that you can say the number of the thing you want to do, and that option is chosen. Or you can say things like scroll forward, uh, tap go back, go home. It's a way of operating your device with your voice, basically. So I'll, I'll go ahead and see if I can show this off here real quick. We'll go to voice actions and I'll turn it on because I haven't been living with it on right now. So I'm going to go ahead and give it that access. Yes. And then uh, let's see here. Voice actions. Boop. Everything. Oh, here, let me unmute because I think I'm muted right now. There we go. So voice actions. Uh, let's see here. 15. And now it's going to open my Amazon Kindle app. And so you can see up there, it's it's transcribing <laughs> everything that I'm saying right now because it's not actively listening. Um, go home. Although maybe that's going to throw it off. <laughs> I don't. How do I get it to stop that? <laughs> it's trying to stop that now. It's like, oh, maybe this is stop how. It, oh, that it's, it's totally. <laughs> Oh no! <laughs> it is totally confused right now. Here, let me let me. Uh, normally, when you're talking to your phone, you're not also recording a show and and telling everyone what you're doing. So, um, can you like tell it to like swipe down on like the notification shade from from this? Okay, let me see. Swipe down notification shade. Sorry, didn't understand. That. Or what about the like the number up at the very top? There are three. Is that supposed to be for the shade? Can you tell it to like swipe down three? Three. 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 That's so weird. It's right there. Hmm. <laughs> swipe, swipe three. <laughs> swipe. This should really work better than this. <laughs> Good thing this is in the arena, Jason. Oh yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, voice actions help. It's like you obviously don't know how to you use know, this app. I mean, I mean, it has been a beta for a while. I, I don't know. I feel like maybe they should have. They would have figured this out. But who knows? I mean, maybe it works better once you get into the groove and you know exactly what you can tell it to uh, say. I I have no doubt that once you get into the groove, it will it will do that. I also know that my talking 
as even when I was trying to talk as quietly as I could into the microphone so it wouldn't pick it up on the phone, it still was. And so all of that was kind yeah. of being I mean, thrown actually, in there. As kind of, it is kind of impressive how, how good assistant was at figuring out every word you said, even when it wasn't being said at the phone. Yeah, exactly. It was really good at listening to every single little thing that I was saying. Um, I, I have no doubt that this works when when used in the right environment and probably during this show is not the right environment. But it's a cool idea, a cool concept. Apply a number to everything on your screen, allow you to control your phone entirely with your voice. I, I do want to know how to swipe down the notifications because that has to be part of this. I mean, that's, that's I an mean, important part of your phone. Like, can you have it like manipulate the number? Like, could you say like, you know, like the, whatever the home button is, would you say swipe up on whatever number to access multitasking now on Pi? Or how would it know? Yeah. You just say like open multitasking or I right. feel like there's probably a tutorial that you're supposed to go to uh, go through. And like we didn't we didn't have that uh, up. So maybe there maybe it tells you important things. When you first launch, it does give you a bunch of things that you that you swipe through that I probably skipped through. Um no. But I was able to get the launching things with numbers. Uh, yeah. I was able to get that working uh, many, you know, many times earlier when I was playing around with it. So I just didn't go too deeply into like notifications or anything like that. So sure you, sure you did, Jason. Stop it, Ron. <laughs> Quit it. Why don't you tell me about all the research you did about SwiftKey and Android with Microsoft Translator? I did so much research. In fact, I can tell you that SwiftKey, the popular keyboard <laughs> replacement app that was purchased by Microsoft, uh, now has Microsoft Translator built into the app uh, for conversation translation. Oh. Um, so no need to install Microsoft Translator. Uh, you don't need to install an add-on or anything. Although if it is installed, offline translation will then work as well. So that's pretty cool. Um, and you access it through the SwiftKey toolbar. Um, and you know, this kind of, it's nice to see Swift key still getting development and updates. We thought, you know, like usually when, uh, companies buy them, uh, the, the product goes away much like Astro and Slack, which I'm still hurting about. <laughs> um, but, uh, no, in this case, Microsoft is keeping the Swift key flame alive and they're integrating their tools into it. That's uh, pretty cool. This is a, a live on the go translation is pretty powerful, especially if you're going to travel abroad. So this is cool to have, and especially if you do download that Microsoft Translate app, Translator app and be able to enable offline version, that's pretty cool. Oh, and I'm sure that you installed it and played around with it, and and I went, that up. I went, I I went to Italy and today and came back and tried it, and it was molto bene. <laughs> okay, I believe you, Ron. Uh, <laughs> by the way, I I think I figured it out. Uh, okay. so, so check this out. So I ha still have it running. So my phone is off, right? So if I unlock it, it's going to launch it right away. So, or it did the last time. Okay. never mind. Show notifications. There we go. Ah, uh, there we go. Oh yeah. And it has, has numbers all over that. That's neat. Yeah, so can you tell it to long press things? Long press Wi-Fi button. <laughs> <laughs> that problem. Six. No, I tapped it. <laughs> okay. tell, tell it to long press six. Okay. Show notifications. Long press six. Long press six. <laughs> <laughs> long like press six. Ah, oh, there it is. Hey. hey. Oh, okay. We we've, we've cracked the code. <laughs> All right. Hey, what are works. we doing now? What are we? <laughs> and you can just tap like anywhere it. it'll stop it. I do like with all the numbers, it looks like a crazy person's device. It really does. It's kind of I mean, hard to look right. at. I mean, I mean, but but the thing is, for accessibility, that's awesome. That's really cool. I mean, if, it, it, you know, you know, like because so much of this, phone, so much of these phones are based off touch and all that sort of stuff, and you can eliminate that and make it via voice. That's pretty cool. But it does look kind of crazy. So. All right, so now <laughs> I have to turn this off, otherwise this is going to drive me insane uh, as I try and show everything else off throughout the rest of the show. So I'm turning off voice access. Sorry, I just can't use you for the rest of the show. Um, because another thing uh, that we have here is if you are waiting for the Pixel 3 event, you don't have to wait very long, very much longer, but maybe you want the wallpapers and live wallpapers and stuff because they've leaked from those phones, those early uh, possibly fake, but let's be real, totally real phones. Uh, <laughs> so XDA has a link to a file with the live wallpapers uh, that you can install. It only runs on Android Pi devices, so if you have Android Pi on your device and you also have Google's Wallpapers app installed, 
then if you install that file from XDA, you'll get uh, the full selection of live wallpapers and regular wallpapers and everything. But, you know, it, it allows you to kind of bring some of those those visual uh, elements onto your phone now. I have one running on my device right now that you can that you've already seen as the backdrop and it's kind of you know one of those interactive things where as you swipe it kind of rotates and everything and another cool thing that it does and I don't know if I'll be able to show it off here is when I'm in the ambient screen it's really hard to see but very faintly the wallpaper starts to poke through and this is such a light contrast for the camera that I don't think you can see it but I can see it with my eyes where those little those little I, I thought your screen was just like extra greasy in those areas. <laughs> well, that that too. <laughs> there, the, the finger marks, but and those are real. But the other <laughs> finger marks are fake. <laughs> but yeah, so it kind of shines through. So, anyways, if you want to, you can install those and feel all Pixel Three E. Um, let's see here. I think that that that's it. We are at the arena. It's time to battle. Why? Why let's wait? Do it. So many enter, <laughs> but only one lives. Android Arena. Last week's poll, twit.to slash triple A poll 388 is where you went to place your vote. And it turns out, did we have any, like, did anyone think that uh, Mateo's goat game wasn't going to win? Actually, I thought it might not, but it did. What's so, what's so funny was that everybody everybody thinks that I'm, I'm so hateful of the goats, but they crack me up. So <laughs> It keeps going and going. Goat Turbo Attack wins at 44% of the votes. Play on, so that was Mateo's. That's a team guest gets their their point there. Yep. Uh, play on cloud. That was uh, flows, right? Yes. Play on cloud. So that was second place. Congratulations, yep. flow. Twenty five percent. Fluid navigation gestures. Third place at sixteen percent. Congrats, Ron. And flip flop solitaire. Wow, fifteen percent. I thought solitaire would do better than that, but I yeah, guess it, it is, is just solitaire. So with those results through 39 weeks, the guests are still firmly in first place with 114 points. Um, with that third place showing, I, I'm now in second place, uh, continuing to be in second place with 98 points. Uh, Jason, unfortunately, you didn't gain any ground or, or that much ground at all. You've got 93 points in third place. And uh, Flo, she, she, she's climbing up uh, after getting that second place now. She's in last place with 83 points. Uh, thanks to Wade County in the chat room for keeping track of that. Yes. Uh, so, yes. Yeah, so, still, guests are in the lead in the year of the guest. The um, year of the guest continues. No pressure, Ryan, but um, you have a mm -hmm. lot to you have a lot to accomplish here today. Just no so. pressure, though. <laughs> no pressure. No pressure. Fine. Don't don't mean to apply pressure, but you better do well. Okay. 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 <laughs> all right. Uh, mine's gonna be quick because we already know what Pac Man is, and I'm a nut for old school games. And apparently, there's a new Pac Man game. And at first, I was like, eh, meh, whatever. It's Pac Man. But um, you know that there's a new Wreck It Ralph movie coming out. Um, what is it? Ralph breaks the internet or something like that. Yeah, it looks great. Anyway, so they've they've released a Pac Man game <laughs> with with a uh, Wreck It Ralph integrated into it. And I don't know, I, I played it a little bit. I kind of liked the changes that they were doing. And I like the control mechanism of this. So obviously there's a lot of different mazes and everything, but you basically just swipe in this big area down here. I wish I could speed it up like Miss Pac-Man or whatever. But the integration is that Wreck-It Ralph, as you can see, is kind of uh, tearing down walls that um, the builder guy, I can't remember his name, builds around here. So basically the maze kind of changes over time and you might suddenly find yourself not, you know, blocked off from another area and whatever. But the rules are still very much the same. There's a bunch of different kind of modes, different maps and different um, Disney, I think, themed versions and, and uh, areas that you can unlock. So it kind of opens up different types of gameplay and everything, but it's really, it's just the Pac-Man, you know, with a new spin on it. And it's, it's fix it. Felix is the builder. Thank you. That's right. Fix it. Felix. And can I just tell you that like Pac-Man is a classic, classic game. It's fantastic. But Bravo Namco for going after the Wreck-It Ralph license and doing this kind of mashup. Like this is like, I looked at this. I'm like, how is this existing? 
<laughs> but yeah. sure enough, it's Namco, the owners of, of Pac-Man, staying uh, staying relevant in this day and age, and integrate. You know, retro gaming is uh, getting uh, you know kind of noticed again from Wreck-It Ralph, and yep. this is such a such a fun integration. It's, uh, yeah, <laughs> and like I said, I know I already mentioned it, but the control mechanism for this, like, there are so many ways where they where developers will take old games and they'll just throw it on a smartphone device and put like con a control joystick in the middle or something like that because that's the way it was in an arcade and that just doesn't work for tap tap uh touch screen this whole mechanism as you can see it's really easy like you just kind of swipe go and continue and it remembers the last direction and it's just really easy to to control you don't like you aren't fighting the controls on this game so I like how is they it, implemented it, that. Is that the only type of controls? Because sometimes they have different version, way, like methods of control. Or is this the only one? Uh, it's is the, the only one that I saw. The set. Yeah. Okay. No, I think that's yeah. it. Yeah. And and they have cool. remix remixed uh, Pac-Man music. So there we go. That's great. Yeah. So that's it. It's called Pac-Man. Ralph breaks the maze. Uh, there is a, f a free section, and then there are paid for um, aspects of the game, in-app purchases, that sort of stuff, as there usually is. But there you go. Pac-Man Ralph Breaks the Maze. All right, Ryan, you are up next, which means I have to go home to a different launcher. Why don't you tell us all about your app? So um, I feel like we could all use a new launcher, right? Yeah. I mean, we've had the same, kind of the same selection of popular launchers for a while. So there's this new one called Niagara Launcher. Um so the thing I like about it is that it look look how look how like clean and simple it is. Like when you start it up, it has you select your favorite apps. Like you can put up to eight of them, and those are the ones that stay on the main home screen. Uh, and then when you want to find the rest of your apps, you just sort of you swipe along the right there, and you get that cool wave effect. Um, and it also has it has it, they, I think it calls it like enhanced notification dots. So if you have a notification on one of your apps. You can either you like swipe to the side or tap the little dot, and it pulls up uh, a window that covers about half of the screen and shows you like the full expanded text of the notification. And you can still swipe it to to clear it out of the way, uh, like you would with a regular notification dot. Um, it's obviously still like you know it's still early, um, but there have been a couple updates already. I think the developer added um, added like a, a dark mode. It added um, uh, support for icon packs. Um, and there are other things coming. So I think, you know, even if it's a little light on features for you right now, it's something to watch. I think it has an interesting look and uh, approach to sort of, you know, cleaning up your home screen. So, yeah, uh, Niagara Launcher, check it out. Nice. I like the wave effect. Yeah, it's very cool. It's very yeah. satisfying. It actually works really well with this live wallpaper, too. <laughs> it does match the, the, wall, the wallpaper does match it. That's really funny. Like, yeah, you, can also, you can turn off the uh, you can turn off the alphabet showing up like just on the, the home screen before you open it. If you if you want to like keep it even cleaner, like that's oh, optional that in the settings. But yeah, but yeah. Nice. I like it. Niagara launcher. Fresh and clean. Fresh and clean. And clean. <laughs> <laughs> Jason. Uh, oh, like a man. like Folgers crystals. <laughs> yeah, just like Folgers crystals, fresh <laughs> and clean. All right. Um, my app is super nifty, and I want you to check it out. It is called Idea Note, um, and it's actually a little um, note taking uh, kind of reminder app. But the interface is really cool. Uh, once you uh, enable it, uh, for, you know, it, you go through enable all the accessories and stuff like that. What happens is, is that go back to the home screen there, Jason. Oh, um, uh, home screen. Uh, just, yeah, your, your desktop or whatever. Your, oh, your, my, my home screen. Yeah, home screen. Yeah, home screen. Um, see that in the upper right hand corner? There's that little kind of a little bit of a uh, little bit of darkness there. There you go. Oh. And that's where you get your notes in these little pill format, um, which is really neat. And so from here, you can access any other note. You can move them. You can reorder them and all that sort of stuff. Um, but then you could, uh, down at the bottom bar, you can take a new note either by typing or by talking. Um, so we're back to the voice control. But you can uh, you can say something, Jason, if you want. Hey, how's it going? Uh, oh, it, it, I don't know if you're on voice yeah, anymore. Now you're typing. But, hey, um, what's up? <laughs> so there you go. So creative. Uh, okay, uh, so, but. But it's a great way to, to quickly take notes, you know, if you're, you're on your commute or if you're driving or if you're, well, don't do it while you're driving, but pull over and then take the note. Um, 
but you're able to, uh, you know, kind of add, you know, um, all, you know, you can attach things, you can set timers around it. It's, it's, it has a whole bunch of the functionality that you would think about it, but it's this kind of hiding it in these little pill formats are pretty cool. So when you click away from it, Jason, um, or tap away from it, it just goes away. But now that's not the only way you can get to these. Um, if you, uh, add a widget, can you add widgets to your screen? Heck Yeah. I and you could go idea. find the you can find the uh what is it idea the idea idea under idea. i there it is almost there uh, come on come on so, so, all the uh, G, idea no there it is there it is so it's a little one by one put it anywhere and if you tap that it will appear so if you don't like that little notch thing you could do that you could also change it so that you instead of accessing assistant on your phone if you hold long press the home button um, so basically, you can go into the settings and you could change it to, to basically they've given you a bunch of different ways to access your notes. Um, you see that that explains how you do it there. You could also do it by um, I wouldn't I wouldn't okay. All right, suggest well. changing it. Yeah, that's weird. Um, you could also set it to use the volume down button. You could always use it to automatically detect your voice. So it's super flexible in how it could do it. But then also you could just go into the app and access all your notes. They're all right here as well. Oh, um, and then if you hit the plus if you hit the plus button in the upper right hand corner. Um, you can create a new note and just type from there. So even if you don't want to use their little on top of the screen um, interface, you're able to manage all your notes from here. Um, so yeah, so really, you know, really uh, interesting kind of inventive way to use voice and you know, kind of overlays on your screen and different ways to to add in um, you know kind of detection. Um, and just I was really really impressed. It was a really well done uh, app. If you go into the settings at the very bottom there. Um, not only can you, you can adjust with the speak record, speech recognition, recognition, you can change the theme of how it looks. You can customize the floating window, um, to, you know, to behave how you want it to. You can change the, the, the toolbar cover color, um, cards of the notes. You can change their size and their spacing. Um, and you can customize the shortcut. It's like infinitely customizable. It gives you a lot of power over the control of the app. Um, so yeah, so idea note, great note taking. Uh, I actually, the full name is idea note, voice note, floating note, idea pill. Um, but <laughs> at least they got every single fun sh function in there. Hey man, SEO is a real thing. Um, so, you know, really innovative, creative way to keep notes, give yourself reminders, capture information on the go and be able to access it in a, uh, in an innovative kind of way. It's free in the Google play store, uh, idea note worth checking out. Right on. Idea note, voice note, floating note, idea pill. <laughs> That's what it's friends. That's what they call it. it. That's, That's what, what they call it. Call it was it. hard to fit that on the lower curve. <laughs> I think idea note is probably good enough. All right. So go to twit.to slash AAA poll 389 to place your vote for your favorite app this week. Is it Pac-Man Ralph Breaks the Maze, Niagara Launcher Fresh and Clean, or idea note, voice note, floating note, idea pill? You could, <laughs> you could place your vote and let us know. We'll check in on it next week. It appears early reports are in. Pac-Man is leading. Idea Node and Niagara Launcher are tied in second. I think Pac-Man's gonna gonna run away with it. To be honest with you, as cool as Niagara Launcher and Idea Node are, and innovative interfaces, uh, Wreck-It Ralph and Pac-Man is a great combination. I mean, er early returns, uh, as indicated by Victor's vote. And Victor usually represents a lot of people when he chooses to vote one way or the other. And he voted Pac-Man. So is, is anybody doing exit polling or anything? I feel like this isn't accurate. <laughs> yeah, we I mean, I, I wouldn't say trust this entirely because as, <laughs> as we know, anything can happen. But as it stands right now, this is the data that we have. It's what we have to work with. So uh, good stuff. And we are at the end. We have reached the end of this show. And man, we did it on time this time. I love it when good it job. works out like that. I was about to say, you guys are really good at this. <laughs> we you well, like a go team. Terrible or something. Well, Ryan, I don't know if you noticed, but we're nearly at our 400th episode. So it's been, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's been a lot. Not, uh, we're embarrassingly close to that, I think. Jeez. It's <laughs> uh, crazy. Yeah, they add up quick. Uh, although maybe not. What? How long have we been doing this now? Eight years, something like that. Seven, eight years. Yeah, I was having a conversation with somebody about podcasting, and and I was telling them about iFanboy, the comic book podcast that that I helped co-found, and we're, that podcast is north of 650 episodes, and it's like, wow, man, 
13 years of doing this. We've been doing this for seven or eight years. It's like crazy. You're like yeah. 13 years, still doing this 13 years later. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> still setting up the, the microphone and, and deal and still complaining about Skype every week. Yes, exactly. That's, that's been the one constant. On all yes, these 13 absolutely. Years of since the beginning. Uh, Ryan Whitwam, you write so many places. Uh, you can be founded uh, on Twitter at Ryan Whitwam. Where, where do you want to point people to follow all of your awesome work online? Um, so yeah, I mean, well, follow follow me on Twitter. I'll post links to things that I write, and also just like pictures of keyboards, probably. Um, and then uh, yes, and then Android Police and the Wire Cutter and Extreme Tech uh, and Tested.com and plenty of other places on occasion. Damn. Go to all those places. Those are all good sites, uh, completely irrespective of the uh, content that I write for them. You work so much. When do you have time to live? I've been actually, I've been writing while we've been doing this. I, I wrote a couple articles, like they're done, they're posted. Uh, that's, wow. not, that's not true. Uh, no, that's not true. Um, but no, I do. I just, I write a lot. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. No kidding. Well, awesome work. And it's always great to get you on, man. Thank you so much for yes, carving is, out a few uh, hours for us tonight. It is always fun to be here. <laughs> right on. Thanks again, Ryan. And Ron, it's always fun to do a podcast with you as well. 389 episodes later, plus, plus well, give or take a few. Would miss it every t Jason, you, you, I, you, my Tuesdays are yours. That's what it is. <laughs> your, your Tuesday evenings for two hours and then that's for sure. Then it's that's for late. sure. Uh, what, uh, uh, what you got? Yeah. So, uh, you can go follow me on Twitter at Ron XO or on Instagram at Ron XO. And if you're following me on Twitter, you might've saw earlier today, I tweeted about the latest episode of my new podcast, yes. uh, that I do with, uh, my, my lovely co-host Carrie. Uh, you can find that at finale podcast.com. The podcast is called finale, uh, where we, uh, examine the series finale of a beloved TV show that one of us has watched. Um, this week's episode is about the wonder years. Uh, Carrie never saw the series finale of the Wonder Years. I did. Uh, I've seen it so much because it makes me cry every time. And did it make uh, you so cry? We, and it, was it the original yeah. version with the original music, or was it the new yeah. version with all the replaced music? We, we we discussed that. We discussed, of course, the original version with the, with the original. Uh, Jason, you'll appreciate the theme song of the of this episode of the podcast. Uh, Joe Cocker forever. Um, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was a lot of fun. It's been about a half an hour talking about the last episode of uh, one of my favorite shows of all time, uh, The Wonder Years. So yeah. go to finalepodcast.com, check it out. And we're also now on Spotify. If you listen, to, if you listen to podcasts on Spotify, you can find us there. So nice. Right on. Yeah. I will definitely check this out. I pulled up the page earlier. I was like, oh, man, I have to listen to this one. This <laughs> Smallville and Gilmore Girls. Those are just shows that I've never watched. But Wonder Years. Yeah. Absolutely. So, yep. right on. Thanks again, Ron. Uh, and Victor, thanks again to you. You were you were on it tonight, man. Thank you for voting for my app. No problem, man. And thanks to was it Abby for the email? Yes. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> Abby or a B or yes. Team uh, Victor. <laughs> that's right. Uh, you can find me all across the Twit Network doing shows. That's what I do here. Although I won't be here next week. So next week you guys are gonna somehow what? I'm out. On the week of the big, how did, uh, I miss, yeah. how did I miss that? You're not going to be here next week. Yeah, no, I'm not here next week. Oh, my big moment it's, where I like, I finally got to go inside the event, and I can't oh. and I can't wait to hear all about it. But no, I won't be on the show, unfortunately. Uh, yeah, it's in the dock there; it's in the schedule. But Duncan Jaffrey from Australia will be here. Flo will be here in studio. You'll be right. fresh back from the announcement. You guys will have a lot to talk about. It's going to be a great Crazy. episode, and I wish I could be here, but I won't. Won't be so. I'll have to catch it on the podcast feed. Uh, but that is all we got for you. Voicemails, 347-SHOW-AAA. Send us an email at AAA at twit.tv. Find us on Twitter. We are at Android Show. Uh, the Arena Apps list where we have listed each and every app we've ever had in the arena at twit.to slash Android Apps. A big thanks to the folks uh, that keep that maintained. Show notes and past episodes can be found. Probably the most important page for this show is twit.tv slash AAA. There you're going to find everything you need to know, how to subscribe, all of our past episodes, all of our show notes, like I said, and uh, the times that we record are there, too. Uh, we record every Tuesday starting at 5 p.m. Pacific. And if you want to catch that live, you can twit.tv slash live. But that is it. We'll see y'all next week for a huge week of news on another uh, another episode of All About Android. Bye, everybody. Have fun next week. <laughs>